Good afternoon, everyone. I'm City Council Member Chi Ose, Chair on the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. Welcome to today's oversight hearing on equity, civic engagement, and the role of libraries. At this hearing, the committee will also be hearing several pieces of legislation which are unrelated to this oversight topic, but are also important. Resolution number 285, sponsored by Council Member Charles Barron, calling upon the United States Congress and President to end the Cuban embargo and Cuban truck travel ban. Resolution number 387, sponsored by Deputy Speaker Diana Ayala, calling on the U.S. Congress to repeal the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, commonly known as the Jones Act. And finally, resolution number 392, co-sponsored by Council Members Tiffany Caban and Alexa Aviles, supporting a democratically governed public entity that will provide reliable and affordable electrical power to the people of Puerto Rico and supporting the cancellation of the contract with Luma Energy. Um, currently, none of my colleagues are in the room right now, but we will go back to uh, potentially hearing statements from Council Member Caban and Council Member Barron about their resolutions. Let me start our oversight hearing on equity, civic engagement, and the role of libraries by invoking the words of one of our library administrators, which were shared during a call with council staff over the past several weeks, and which get at the heart of why we're here today. Libraries are for everyone. Libraries are safe for everyone, and that's why when the city rolls out a new program, it looks to the libraries because people are comfortable going into a library. The two libraries are in the role they play. That role, supporting equity in New York City and promoting civic engagement among all of our residents, cannot be more fundamental and important to the way our city functions and who we are as New Yorkers. Libraries are one of the most democratic and accessible institutions in the city. There is no charge to enter a library, and given that the city's three library systems operate in 220 locations across the five boroughs, offering free and open access to books, periodicals, electronic resources, and non-print materials. It is amazing, but perhaps not surprising, that there is a library within 30 minutes of any New Yorker's home. Additionally, libraries set an example in accessibility. The three library systems maintain robust and diverse collections in multiple languages and provide access to computers, wireless internet, and other technology at no cost to library patrons thus serving as a critical resource for low-income and non-English speaking households. They also promote equitable access to mobile technology by, pro by providing widespread Wi-Fi access and by lending tablets and laptops to patrons free of charge. Libraries are also reliable in a model of resiliency. When the COVID-19 pandemic forced all of New York City's library branches to close their doors in the community in March of 2020, the three library systems continued to serve patrons by moving their services online, which each system is witnessing immediate, unprecedented, and exponential increases in the number of New Yorkers accessing virtual library resources and services. These resources bridged the gap for many New Yorkers during the pandemic by serving our most underserved neighborhoods, especially by providing resources to elementary and secondary students, including free after-school homework help, recreational programming, access to technology, including lending hotspots to students, virtual summer reading camp and summer reading kits in English and Spanish, and online on the phone story time for kids in English, Spanish, and Mandarin. The library systems also bridge the gap for adults by offering individualized job support, services, English classes for speakers of other languages, voting related virtual discussions and election reading lists and citizenship classes. The very definition of equity is in the inscription above the entrance to Brooklyn Central Library's main branch, which states that BPL, quote, offers to all the people per perpetual and free access to knowledge and the thought of all the ages. Today, our libraries faithfully serve every neighborhood and every population in our city, including teens, older adults, immigrants, and asylum seekers incarcerated and formerly incarcerated individuals, veterans, and LGBTQIA constituents. They host countless citizen groups at their facilities, participatory budgeting events, voter registration drives, and passport services, and IDNYC offices. They facilitate involvement in the democratic process and ensure that every New Yorker counts, as we witnessed in the city's census efforts. I'm eager to learn more about ways in which the city's three library systems serve and support the broader New York City community 
and for us to reflect together on how the city council can continue to support their efforts. Finally, I want to understand how our libraries and their civic engagement and equity work will be affected by the administration's program to eliminate the gap or the pegs. Before I move on, I want to acknowledge my colleagues on the committee who are present, uh, Council Member Caban, who is remote, Council Member Hudson, who is also remote, Council Member Dinowitz, Council Member Farias, and Council Member Ung. I would also like to thank my staff and the committee staff for their work in preparing today's hearing. Uh, Naomi Hopkins, my Chief of Staff, May Vutra Pong Vatana, my Policy and Budget Director, Brenda McKinney, the Committee's Senior Legislative Counsel, Regina Paul, the Committee's Legislative Policy Analyst, and Sandra Gray, the Committee's Financial Analyst. Finally, I would like to address some housekeeping items before we begin with the Administration's testimony. First, as a reminder, today is an in-person hearing with the option of virtual testimony for the public. The committee will be accepting registrations for testimony throughout the hearing. Anyone who is attending in person and who wishes to testify in person should see the sergeant at arms to fill out a witness slip, even if you are registered or registered online uh, in advanced. As usual, we will begin today's hearing with testimony from the three library systems, followed by council member questions and answers, and then move to public testimony. We will limit council member questions and answers, including comments to five minutes, during the public testimony portion of the hearing, witnesses from the public will be limited to two minutes. As a reminder to all our witnesses, please state your name prior to your testimony for the record. The committee will also be accepting written testimony for up to 72 hours after the hearing. And now, since we do not need to swear in today's witnesses. Okay. Um, I also want to acknowledge Council Member uh, Farah Lewis, and I do want to uh, pass the torch to my colleague, Councilmember Caban, who will share remarks on her resolution. Thank you very, very much, um, Chair. Good afternoon. My uh, my name is Councilmember Caban. My pronouns are she, her. And I want to start by thanking everyone for joining. And again, thank you, Chair Osei, for holding this important hearing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, resolution 392, which is on the agenda today, calls for an immediate end to the contract with Luma Energy that has imposed unbearable and unacceptable conditions for the people of Puerto Rico. This rezo joins the voice of Puerto Rico's own House of Representatives, which passed a resolution earlier this year calling for the termination of Luma's Ener Luma Energy's temporary contract. <coughs> In spite of seven rate hikes since June 2021, under Luma Energy, Longer and more frequent power outages have become the standard, not the exception. And as we all know, hurricanes will only increase in, in intensity, intensity and frequency as our climate continues to change. It is in this context, as well as the cultural context of outside occupation and colonization, that a public electrical utility governed by a democratically elected board of Puerto Ricans themselves is essential to the well-being of the island. So thank you, Regina Paul from the Ledge Division and my legislative director, Madre Shukla, for your work in drafting this important resolution. Thanks. <coughs> thank you, Council Member Caban. I hope you feel better. Um, let's dive into the questions, shall we? Uh, we'll start with you, President Johnson. Um, what is your perspective on the roles of libraries as it relates to equity and civic engagement? And why does this matter? Um, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Jose. Um, and thank you for quoting those wonderful remarks from the facade of the Central Library. All of us who walk into that building on a daily basis um, get to read those comments, and it definitely drives the work that we do. I'm Linda Johnson, I'm President and CEO of the Brooklyn Public Library, and I would like to thank you and uh, Speaker Adams and committee members for this opportunity to testify, and thank you as well to our Brooklyn delegation and the entire City Council for your efforts to ensure that our branches remain safe and inclusive spaces for all. Five years ago, as a response to former President Trump's Muslim ban, the executive order prohibiting citizens of, the seven most, of seven mostly Muslim countries from visiting the United States, Brooklyn Public Library's Bay Ridge branch put a sign uh, out on the door that read, you are welcome here, you are loved. With racist and anti-immigration rhetoric on the rise, Brooklyn Public Library adopted this as our unofficial slogan across our 62 locations and our 100 outreach sites. 
we created an Everyone is Welcome Here campaign in 12 languages and launched a multilingual and cultural series to show patrons that the library is for everyone and that we mean it. To further our commitment to inclusion, we focused on programming and policy changes that open doors, particularly for underserved communities. Along with our colleagues at the New York Public Library and Queens Public Library, we eliminated late fines for overdue books, removing one of the biggest barriers for low-income households. We also expanded our language offerings. Today, patrons can access our library materials in over 125 languages and library services in about 200 languages through translation devices and language line, a live phone-based interpretation service. Just this week, we kicked off a month-long Heritage Ambassador Program, which brings folk and traditional artists, library staff, and communities together through storytelling and relationship building. Throughout December, we will host several in-person and virtual events featuring Korean folklore, indigenous art, Nigerian and Trinidadian textiles, steel pan and calypso music, Haitian storytelling, and more. Earlier this year, we released the latest version of our strategic plan, Finding Level Ground. It's a plan that builds on our commitment to diversity, equity, and community participation with objectives developed, uh, which, with objectives developed the pan during the pandemic, an intense period of growth and learning. The planning process, which began in spring of 2021, included a series of listening sessions that helped us identify the following four strategic priorities for the next two years. First is the community connections. After more than two years of pandemic-related service disruptions and physical closures, reestablishing neighborhood relationships and strengthening in-person programming is a top priority. We know the effects of COVID-19 pandemic will be felt in Brooklyn for years to come as residents continue to grapple with evolving public health threats, learning loss among school children, and increasing economic uncertainty. While we successfully transitioned to digital services, making historic investments in our electronic books and resources during the pandemic, we face a particular challenge now, balancing in-person and virtual offerings. Brooklyn Public Library strives to offer the innovative and cutting edge programming that we are known for, providing it all in the ways the public has come to expect. Our second strategic priority is digital inclusion. Public libraries have been leading advocates for digital inclusion and equity. In Brooklyn, this movement is more important than ever. Nearly 30% of Brooklynites lack a home broadband connection, with a much higher rate in neighborhoods like East New York, where the number soars to 50%. During pandemic closures, many families were completely cut off from crit critical digital resources, further exacerbating disparities we had been working to overcome. In order to increase internet access during the pandemic, we launched the Brooklyn Reach Project, extending our Wi-Fi signal outside of our branch buildings 300 feet in all directions, 24 hours a day. And because digital equity is an economic issue, we are helping community members access low-cost internet services. This fall, we launched Digital Navigators, a program that builds awareness around the FCC's affordable connectivity program and provides one-on-one -on -one support to interested patrons, including, including those who speak languages other than English. At the same time, BPL will continue to serve as a hub for internet-based resources. We are investing in new tools and spaces for digital learning, including new teen tech, a new teen tech center in Crown Heights Library, a tech mobile to help us better reach underserved communities, and expanded laptop and hotspot lending, especially for our adult learning and justice initiatives. Our third strategic priority is to continue building a culture of anti-racism and anti-bias in all Brooklyn Public Library locations and neighborhoods. Libraries and librarians are among the most trusted resources within our society. 
offering spaces where everyone is welcome to pursue their interests and dreams. For young people, librarians are often among the most dependable adults in their lives, caring role models they can turn to for guidance for almost anything, from helping with schoolwork and extracurricular interests to sharing the excitement and struggles that accompany coming of age. In our incredibly diverse borough, it is essential for children and youth to have librarians whose backgrounds they share and for library staff to represent and reflect the communities they serve. But nationally, the field of librarianship is, is remarkably homogeneous. 84% of American librarians are white, while BPL's librarians are already significantly more diverse than the national average we are de determined to better represent Brooklyn. Towards this goal, we, re we launched Pathways to Leadership. The program offers scholarships for master's degrees in library and information services for existing non-librarian staff from historically underrepresented groups, thus building a more diverse pool of library leaders. We currently have 11 Pathways Scholars representing a range of departments and experience levels within the Brooklyn Public Library system. Some are native New Yorkers, while others hail from more distant places. For all Pathways Scholars, BPL has been central to their lives. In addition to launching the Pathways program, Brooklyn Public Library hosted a system-wide conversation titled Real Talk, Race, Truth, and Transformation and formed an internal diversity, equity, and inclusion council and a board committee. Over the past two years, these committees have examined internal and external policies at the library and held remarkable programs for both staff and the general public. And finally, our fourth strategic priority is supporting our staff, it's critical that all, it's, which is critical to all of our goals and objectives. To nurture the vibrant community-based nature of our library system, we must make sure that our staff has the tools, training, and support they need to thrive. In addition to professional advancement opportunities and mentorship, we found that staff also benefit from increased connections throughout the system. We are committed to creating opportunities for staff to care for and learn from each other across branches and across departments. Brooklyn Public Library's outreach services work is an integral part of, it, of addressing our strategic priorities and overarching goals of inclusion inside and outside our branches. Mm -hmm. Serving immigrants, older adults, people experiencing homelessness, families affected by the justice system, and veterans, we are providing essential services that contribute to healthier, more equitable communities throughout the borough. Many of our patrons are unable to s access services in our branch locations for a variety of reasons. Brooklyn Public Library skilled outreach staff provide a vital conduit for information, tools, and resources for those who need it most. For example, our bookmobiles have traveled more than 2,000 miles this year, participating in nearly 300 outings from block parties to community outreach events. You may have seen one taking Jimmy Kimmel for a ride on his show this past September. And in the coming weeks, they will be on the road visiting shelters to share resources with recently arrived asylum seekers rerouted here from Texas and Florida. Outreach services are especially critical for those who have immigrated from other countries. We provide multilingual programs, including citizenship classes, English classes, seminars for immigrant professionals and entrepreneurs, and legal support from accredited immigration staff and attorneys. For families separated by incarceration, the library fills an often overlooked gap in support. We provide video visitation, jail-based library services in New York City Department of Correction facilities, as well as programs for people when they return home. Our outreach also includes health and wellness program, Programming to improve the overall well-being of Brooklynites, a service more vital than ever over the last two years. As you know, we've partnered closely with the city to offer a variety of services during the pandemic and are currently distributing thousands of free COVID tests, test kits at all of our locations. Our older adult patrons also benefit from outreach and special programming, 
The, techni the technology for all initiative includes workshops and personalized tech support sessions for 1,100 seniors. And we offer art classes and musical performances, books to go, and books by mail service that delivers to 300 older adults who are confined to their homes. We recently wrapped up our third series of Senior Debate in collaboration with the Association for Senior Debate. In this 10 session series, library staff and debate experts taught debate structure, formed teams, and instructed participants in preparing to debate both the affirmative and negative sides of a resolution. There were several weeks of workshops and practice sessions before two weeks of debates leading to the championship tournament on November 15th. This was a great opportunity for older adult patrons to learn a new skill, to engage in civil discourse, and to come together to the library to build new relationships. Programs like Senior Debate also connect our deep and active commitment to civic engagement. If you, fully, if, you, if you are to fully represent the communities we serve, we must provide a platform for our patrons to participate in all levels of civil society. By hosting polling sites every election day and providing voter information and resources, we are contributing to fair elections and, informed, and an informed electorate. By promoting our Books Unbanned programming for teens, we are protecting intellectual freedom, assuring access to information, and encouraging independent thought among young people. By hosting government partners in our branches to provide constituent services, we advocate for patrons and, fa and facilitate connections with elected officials and city agencies. And by attending community board meetings across the borough and hosting participatory budgeting sessions in our branches, we ensure inclusion, community ownership, and long-term investment in the city. By investing in comprehensive community engagement sessions when we re renovate our branch libraries, we are creating stronger connections at to and building responsive, inspiring new spaces. And when we take stakeholders in our initial decision making, we help nurture broader civic engagement and leadership. At a time when so many city residents feel disenfranchised and forgotten, it is more important than ever to create inclusive, welcoming, and functional spaces. Our recently created Civic Commons at Central Library, with its own entrance on Flatbush Avenue, is a dedicated hub for civic organizations and services. It houses the Passport Services Center, the IDNYC office, a computer center, and a community partner office where immigration attorneys meet clients for free and the Brooklyn Borough President hosts weekly constituent service, uh, services hours. The community can use the Civic Commons for a range of programming, including inf informational workshops, voter registration drives, and local committee meetings. At Central Library and most of our branches, patrons can reserve meeting rooms and space, and space to gather. Thanks to your investments over the years, we are renovating one-third of our branches and are constantly working to upgrade all neighborhood libraries so that they are welcoming and inspiring spaces, the kind of spaces the communities deserve. Chair Osei, members of the committee, Brooklyn Public Library is much more than a valuable educational resource for Brooklynites. Our programming and spaces are interwoven throughout the fabric of our patrons' social, civic, and cultural lives. Unfortunately, despite growing needs throughout our community, at a time when we ought to be ramping up our services, we learn that our operating support has been significantly reduced. The library is the city's most democratic civic institution as the chairman explained to us a few moments ago. It protects free speech and nurtures intellectual freedom for patrons of all ages and backgrounds. It responds to the specific needs of community members and provides services they need to participate fully in public life. It empowers informed decision making at a time when our country needs strong, diverse voices more than ever. But we can only meet those needs with your support. By supporting a healthy, thriving library system, you are empowering the vibrant voices of our community. Thank you. Thank you, President Johnson. I do want to acknowledge uh, a couple more of my colleagues who have joined us in this committee. 
Councilmember Moya, who is remote, and Councilmember Joseph. Uh, President Marks. Thank you so much. I am Tony Marks, the president of the New York Public Library. I'm joined by Dr. Brandy McNeil, our deputy director of branch programs and services, as well as Brian Bannon, the Merrill and James Tisch director of the branch libraries and education, as well as other colleagues from across the three systems. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to, of course, thank the speaker as well, and all the members of the committee for this opportunity to testify. You have my written testimony. I am not going to read it to you. The, um, uh, it, simply put, we are the most trusted and the most used civic institution in this city. So everything we do is about equity and civic engagement. That is what we are at the heart of. From our collections, to our programs and services, to our spaces, access to Wi-Fi, all of which you've, you've already eloquently discussed, Mr. Chair, and Linda certainly has. I, I think the way I think about this is we are foundational. We're in every neighborhood, everyone uses us, everyone trusts us, and we are foundational for the notion of equity because equity only works if people have the opportunity to learn and to advance themselves and to find those opportunities when the world has not presented them necessarily to them. The, um, and civic engagement has to be based on information and community, all of which, as Linda has also eloquently described, is what we're doing. We've always been foundational. I think the message today is we are more targeted and we are more proactive now in exactly those missions. The mission hasn't changed. The understanding of the time we live in and the challenges of it for people's sense of fairness and equity, for their willingness or interest in civic engagement means we have to step up. And I think this hearing is further inspiration for us to do it and also a chance for us to demonstrate how we've been working at it and discuss ways forward. So, in terms of collections, of course, we provide the key uh, free access to reading material and knowledge, which is so foundational. Um, we know that the books we have, millions and millions of books, are not available evenly across this city, that we need to make sure that they represent the interests of their communities. We have done so much work on this, but there's more work always to be done. We have to make sure that people are not scared to come into the libraries. That's why we eliminated late fines after you know 100 years of basically a false understanding of what that was going to do. It's why this summer, together with our colleagues, we focused on not just the summer slide, but the pandemic side. We gave away a half a million books because in the poorest neighborhoods of New York, folks don't have their own physical libraries that we want them to establish and use our borrowing privileges to be augmenting and, and adding to it. Uh, that was part of a close to $3 million investment this summer. Um, and including and in making sure that we represent communities, I also want to signal those members of the community with disabilities. The Andrew High School Braille and Talking Book Library, amongst other things, provides 50,000 professionally narrated titles amongst so many other services. Going to services, um, our educational programs uh, fall under the Tisch Director for Branch Education, uh, Libraries and Education, Brian Bannon and his colleagues. And we are, again, focusing in a more explicit way than ever on the under-resourced communities, whether it's our early literacy efforts or our after-school programs, which last year were at 11 locations and this year are at 31, so that students know there is a place you can go and get after-school help that other kids can take for granted, but too many of our kids don't, and we know the difference that can make. We've launched our Teens 360 initiative uh, with the support, explicit support of the mayor and private gifts. We'll now be establishing teen centers in 20 uh, libraries across the city, again, in mostly uh, the under-resourced neighborhoods of this city, using media, using mu music, using technology to draw the teens in already happening in record numbers at the New Yorkos Library. But we want the, to draw them in, to develop those skills, but also then we've got them. We can talk about English language, we can talk about after school, we can talk about colleges and our college guidance programs, we can talk about tech skills, all of it. Um, 
We'll be hiring more teen librarians to help guide all of this, again, with the city's support, for which we are so grateful. Um, in terms of the range of services for adults that uh, Dr. McNeil uh, oversees, 70% of our tech classes are offered in high-needs neighborhoods, and they are the only such free offerings, as is true for English language as well, career counseling and job support. Um, just at the Bronx Library Center, the IDNYC program, as again Linda described, is going through the roof. We're also doubling down in terms of our own institutional practices, not just what we can do in terms of our services, but how we operate and how we use those operations. A good example is our PAGE program. Um, it is one of the largest youth employer programs in the city, hundreds of high school and college age use. We restored it after the pandemic, we've added to it, and we've said, no, this needs to be a more professionalized training program. Opportunities not just to shell books, but across the system, including in the central offices, so that we can play our part in creating a diverse pipeline of talent, not only into the library, where so, uh, such a disproportionate number of our employees were pages, which is amazing, but also a pipeline of talent, of diversity for, you know, all kinds of other operations, not just the library. On civic engagement, look, the first thing I want to say, sorry, is every book that is checked out and returned is a civic act. We are the public good, focused on learning, opportunity, education. And every time New Yorkers use us, which is more than they use any other institution, they are practicing and learning what it means to be involved in a community of public good. Whether it's us offering knowledge and the, the background information, focusing on the attitudes, the trust that the library both demonstrates and receives, as well as how we can help folks mobilize themselves. Not in a partisan way, but around local issues so that they can be interlocutors with you, not just on, not just on participatory budgeting, but across the array of issues. Yes, we are front and center for voter education and registration. You'll find those numbers in my testimony. We've also, of course, been involved in participatory budgeting, uh, and we love it when our own branch technology and branch improvements benefit from uh, our neighbors saying that needs to be a priority, as it so often is. We've launched a new center for educators in schools because we have the most used research library on the planet that has incredible treasures that we need to get out into the classrooms as the basis of curricula, as the basis of lesson plans, such exciting stuff. We're working with uh, the mayor's office on New York City Speaks, as well as thinking of other areas to get explicitly engaged in more civic action, not just the foundational work, which is so essential, but to keep going so that our efforts meet the rising challenge the rising crisis of civic engagement. The teen centers, again, another way to get teens in and then get them involved in civic work, in various experiments. In conclusion, the public library is a radical institution. Our mission is to provide free access of knowledge and opportunity to all New Yorkers and no one does it more or better or even is in the same zip code as the public libraries. That means we need to make extra effort. We have to make extra effort to prioritize our resources and to target our services, not to leave anyone behind, but not to pretend that everyone is equally in need of everything. We're past that. In this moment, we have to ensure that there are institutions that the public can trust and the public can rely on. And we are here to do everything to make sure that we can be that for New Yorkers and that we are partners with you and the City Council and the administration in ensuring that New Yorkers get everything they deserve from their libraries now and going forward. Thank you. Thank you, President Marks. I do want to acknowledge another colleague that has joined us, Councilmember Shahana Hanif and uh, Mr. Buran. Uh, good afternoon. I am Nick Buran, Chief Librarian and Senior Vice President at the Queens Public Library. 
On behalf of the library and our president and CEO, Dennis Walcott, it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Chair Ose and the members of this esteemed committee for the opportunity to speak with you regarding the key role public libraries play in advancing equity and civic engagement. Queens Public Library is committed to serving the most diverse county in the nation and ensuring equity of access and opportunity is at the heart of our work. Regardless of one's background, identity, socioeconomic circumstances, or points of view, libraries welcome everyone. Despite the attacks on intellectual freedom and efforts to censor certain literary works and programs in our libraries across the nation, we continue to make sure that libraries are spaces where all are welcome with dignity and respect and are able to freely seek, access, and express diverse viewpoints. In 2018, QPL established system-wide equity, diversity, and inclusion training and implicit bias workshops for all of our staff. In 2020, building on the work and in response to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and many other black people, and the nation's reckoning around race and systematic racism in our society, Mr. Walcott established the President's Council for Racial Equity, PCRE, at the library. Its mission is to identify racial barriers and policies, procedures, practice, and history that have, have had negative impact on black employees and customers, and to identify solutions to create more equitable experience for all. PCRE members, who total over 50 dedicated employees, are examining QPL recruitment, hiring and promotion practices, culture, learning, and growth opportunities, governance, programs and services, collections and outreach, and marketing strategies. The PCRE is working with a consulting firm that specializes in supporting anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts at nonprofits and government organizations to create a comprehensive plan for lasting change at our institution. The library's LGBTQ plus allies committee formed in 2018 aims to promote the visibility of LGBTQ lives to deepen understanding and to ensure an inclusive environment for staff and the public. Since its creation, the committee has led to the development of numerous measures to make sure the public feels more welcome. For instance, earlier this year, the committee spearheaded the distribution for the entrance of all our lo locations of window decals with QPL logos, the pride flag, and the phrase, everyone is welcome here in English, Spanish, and Chinese. Additionally, recognizing that some customers may not be comfortable speaking to staff about personal situations, the committee created signs listing a range of potentially sensitive topics and identifying where such books are located within our collections. Located in the collections area of every QPL library with 40 topics listed, these signs, in, these signs guide customers in finding subjects such as abortion, depression, loss of a child, and personal finance. The committee also supports the library's participation in the annual Queen's Pride Parade and Festival. Staff, customers, and volunteers march under the QPL banner in celebration and solidarity and offer resources and services during the parade. In 2019, we were honored with the Screaming Queens Award, awarded to the group with the best sound at the parade. Queens is the home of nearly 1.1 million immigrants speaking over 150 languages. For 45 years, QPL's New Americans program has aided the borough's immigrants in adapting to life in the United States while celebrating their cultures. Immigrants can come to our libraries and learn English, their rights, and the realities of the immigration process, preparing for the citizen's exam, and receive support from experienced lawyers and staff. Our English language learner and high school equivalency classes are offered in beginner, intermediate, and advanced levels. And we offer supplemental educational applications, allowing students to hone their skills at their own pace. With attendance of over 15,500 and exit surveys showing educational gains of 60%, these classes provide quality lessons with devoted instructors at no cost. QPL has been instrumental in helping asylum seekers in Queens adjust to their circumstances. Staff have conducted outreach in shelters where people are staying, providing them with books, games, school supplies, and gloves, as well as information on free library services such as ESOL classes and our hotspot lending program and other QPL resources. When asylum seekers come to our central library to, to apply for IDNYC cards, 
Staff volunteer their time to provide inter interpretation services to answer questions and provide assistance in the application process. Our adult learner center case managers will be making appointments for people with the city's new asylum seeker resource navigation centers. We will be expanding our Spanish language and bilingual collections at targeted locations for both adults and children. We have trained staff system-wide so they are prepared to meet the needs of our newest arrivals and we will continue to work with the Adams administration to provide additional support. On December 5th, we launched Language Line, a live phone-based interpretation service at all of our locations. Each public service location has at least one handset at a reference desk or circulation desk. With the ability to, in to interpret 240 languages, this new service removes the significant barrier to access to our resources and other information for many customers. Language Line Solutions, a major provider of interpretation and translation services around the world, is operating the system. After identifying their languages from a, from a list of 36 of the most commonly spoken in Queens, customers can have three-way communications with a staff member and interpreter. So far, customers speaking languages such as Spanish, Mandarin, Cantonese, French, Arabic, Pashto, Russian, and Urdu have used the service at Central, Flushing, Poppenhusen, Queensboro Hill, and South Ozone Park, among other locations. In partnership with the New York City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, MOYA, we offer Action NYC, a program that allows New Yorkers to access free and safe immigration legal help. In fiscal year 2021, despite the COVID-19 pandemic, we provided over 110 immigration sessions. We also collaborated with MOYA and the U.S. Citizen, Citizenship and Immigration Services for our New Americans Corners, dedicated spaces at every location that serves as an easy way for immigrants to find resources on how to become U.S. citizens. These services are extremely popular across the borough. At our Laurelton branch, a Jamaican immigrant customer came to the library worried about preparing for her upcoming citizenship exam. The customer service specialist offered to review the materials with her during the weekly one-on-one -on -one session over the course of eight weeks. The patron, who is now studying to become a nurse, recently visited the library to show the specialist her citizenship certificate and thank him for all his help. The Far Rockaway Teen Library provides teens with dedicated space they can call their own, helping them explore their interests and learn outside the classroom with their peers and trusted adults. In partnership with the Queen's Defenders, the library has a youth justice court with teachers 13 to 19 year olds about the criminal justice system and provides an alternative response to youth crime in the community. During the pandemic, 40 to 50 youth met virtually each week to participate in Know Your Rights workshops, mock trials, and a multi-week series called Justice Without Barriers, which engaged the formerly incarcerated and their families. Youth Justice Court often serves as a pipeline for its participants to positive roles within the community. For example, Youth Justice Court provided Jaden Gabb who is the youngest member of the Queen's Community Board 14, where he advocates for the youth of Far Rockaway. In October, we announced the expansion of a successful program to several other libraries under the Mayor's Teen Initiative. In addition to the Youth Justice Court sites, QPL is upgrading teen centers at Central, Cambria Heights, and the Flushing Libraries, as well as establishing new centers at the Long Island City Library. With guidance and assistance from our dedicated staff, Teens will be able to develop creative and technology skills, receive counseling and resources to navigate the college application process and identify a post-secondary path and learn the impact of community service and civic engagement. For young adults who are 16 to 24 years old, our staff at the Central Library and Far Rockaway Teen Library will offer high school equivalency preparations as well as digital literacy support, workforce readiness and resume workshop case management services, and more. For too long, our policies of imposing fines for overdue library materials discouraged individuals from accessing our services, especially our youth. In October 2021, Queens Public Library, along with our colleagues at Brooklyn and New York Public Libraries, permanently ended the practice of charging late fines on overdue materials and cleared all existing late fines on customer accounts. When the policy was enacted, there was a 10% increase in the number of impacted cardholders who borrowed physical material compared to the month prior, and a 16% increase in requested activity among impacted cardholders. 
Now, more than a year into implementation, 4,898 customers who have had their fines removed as a result of the policy change have returned to use our free resources. We hope this policy continues to encourage customers, especially our youngest users, to come back to their local library. Under the Go Vote NYC grant, Queens Public Library worked with over 20 partners to conduct 37 programs, reaching 3,100 participants. We also conducted nine outreach events, connecting with 3,500 individuals, and hosted text banking with approximately a quarter of a million messages delivered. Last month, 12 of our libraries served as general election sites, and four served as early voting locations. QPL, QPL volunteers opportunities encourage people to contribute to their communities in meaningful and sustained ways. For example, our volunteers support mobile food pantries held at our libraries in partnership with Food Bank for NYC, provided interpretation services for asylum seekers, and conduct English conversation groups for new Americans. In October 2020, QPL's Volunteer Services Department began a six-month series focused on community building and engagement to encourage individuals to become more active in civic, education, and social service arenas affecting their neighborhood. These discussions cover vital topics such as strategies for community change, public speaking, and tools for strategic planning. Additionally, the library created an online resource, microsite, supporting the goals of the pro project. This initiative gained a local, national, and international audience, with nearly 1,000 people registering for activities and over 300 individuals attending the workshops. In the coming, upcoming year, we are continuing this important series with a concentration on media literacy, cultural awareness, community wellness, and emergency preparedness. Last year, QPL, QPL worked with the NYC Department of Corrections and other community partners on get out the vote efforts on Rikers Island. Our correctional outreach service staff created two videos for inmates' tablets in English and Spanish, focusing on voter information and voting rights. Prior to the 2021 election, the voter information video was viewed by over 100 individuals, while the latter was watched by uh, nearly 75 times. We also distribute Make Your Voice Heard flyers to 40 housing units and included them in a book packages. These efforts continue into 2022. When the tablets were discontinued at Rikers, we worked closely with NYC Votes to create a hard copy voter guide for the upcoming election and distributed it throughout Rikers Island. These are just a few of the examples of the work QPL staff do each day to help people find success in their lives and participate in our democracy. Unfortunately, at a time when NYC Public Library should be expanding services for our customers, QPL is facing significant cuts to our budget. While we are still reviewing the potential impact, it is clear that if these cuts are not reversed, library operations will be greatly affected. We are in ongoing communications with the administration regarding the consequences of the proposed cuts and will be able to provide an assessment at our preliminary budget hearing in the new year. Despite the challenges ahead, we remain dedicated to providing high quality resources, information, and opportunity for all. Thank you for your partnership in creating a more equitable and engaged city. And thank you again, Chair, for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Mr. Buron. Um, we've been joined by Council Member Charles Barron, and I want to turn to him for uh, some brief remarks on resolution number 285. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. First of all, I want to thank you for this historic resolution. This is something that has not come to the floor ever in the City Council, no matter how much we try to make it happen. And that's a a resolution on calling the United States Congress and President to end the embargo on Cuba. Uh, Cuba is an island of 11 million people, and over the years, since it's been like 60 years since the revolution in 1959, America has either tried to assassinate the Fidel Castro over 600 times, or the embargo that they held uh, highly against uh, the Cuban people, which hurt the Cuban people, and it's hurting the Cuban people right now. Even though the whole world has said, the whole world, the last time they brought the resolution before the United Nations, the world of over 190 some odd countries, 140, 84 countries said, end the embargo. It has no use 
for anything but vindictiveness, and this is not what countries should be about. So this resolution is basically saying, ban the travel to Cuba, allow people to travel to Cuba, allow Cuba to use its products like vaccine. They have some of the best vaccine in the world, but they can't share it with anybody because of the embargo. And they also have the best medical school in the world. I've been to Cuba, and to my surprise, when I went to the international medical school, uh, two students said, hey, Councilman Barron, how you doing? <laughs> there were two students from East New York getting a free medical education uh, from Cuba only if they commit to come back to their community and use their experiences for that. So Cuba has been the friend of Africa. A lot of our countries in Africa, when they were under colonialism, it was Cuba that came forth in Angola and in Zimbabwe and in uh, South Africa. It was Cuba who came forth to help Patrice Lumumba in the Congo and in Latin America. Uh, Cuba has been there sending doctors, because they believe in internationalism, sending doctors and technicians. I went to the island of Grenada, and Maurice Bishop, under the leadership of the New Jewel Movement, Cuba was there helping them build an international airport. Went to Jamaica, and there was Michael Manley, the Prime Minister of Jamaica. Cuba was there helping them with them. So Cuba has had an international commitment to helping developing countries in the world. Now it's our opportunity, our chance to tell this government enough is enough. You know, end the ban, end the blockade to uh, um, embargo, end the ban on traveling so Cuba can develop uh, as a nation and as a friendly nation. And they always try to accuse uh, Cuba of uh, uh, of being a, a, a bastion for terrorism. That's a lie. It never happened. They never supported any terrorism. They've been the victims of terrorism, but they never supported any form of terrorism. So this resolution we put in forward is just to bring the correct, the right information about Cuba. And when we benefit Cuba, we benefit those of us here in New York City because of what they're able to contribute throughout the world. It's the humane thing. This is a human rights issue. And the Cuban government is suffering. The Cuban people are, are suffering. When governments go to war, the people that really suffer is not the government officials. It's the people in these countries. So I always try to separate the government from the people because the people in most countries are good hard working, trying to survive people. It's the governments that have the problem and cause the problem for everybody. So I want to thank you once again, again uh, Mr. Chair, for allowing this resolution to go forward, and I'm hoping that all of us can support it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Barron. And I know Council Member Dinowitz has a time constraint, so I want to turn to him for initial questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your uh, flexibility. Child care these days is... Uh... <laughs> you understand. Um, my first question is for President Marks. Uh, so first, I always say I, I love our libraries, and not just as places for our kids and families to go, but you as, as an agency are always responsive when my office reaches out. Uh, last year, we reached out about um, uh, civil service exam books and preparation books uh, in, in one of the neighborhoods in my district in, in Bengali. Uh, we reached out. You provided those books for that library. This year, we reached out. You were distributing books, as you mentioned in your testimony. Uh, we had books in English and Spanish, but none in Bengali. Bengali. We reached out. You provided those books. And now our children in the neighborhood have books to bring home. So my question is, um, I'm appreciative that when I reach out, you know, you, you respond. But do you do community surveys, or do you look at census data to actually um, proactively provide the books and the languages that the communities need? Because it's, it seems that it's, it's done in response. Thank you for the response. Um, but, but do you do it proactively? So thank you, Councilman. The um, yes is the answer. We both, we're, we're delighted to get feedback. We can always improve by feedback, no matter how good our systems are. And we can always do better at this. But we have an elaborate uh, a back office. We share part of that with, uh, with Brooklyn. Uh, the, we call it Book Ops. And we are getting data. We have a whole data, uh, we have a whole data operation, a strategy operation that looks at the shifts of demands and demographics in the neighborhood under Brian and his team uh, working to say, okay, how do we shift our collection strategy? We know that, you know, the neighborhood I grew up in Wood was Irish and Jewish. It's now Dominican. Obviously, what's in that library needs to change and has changed. And we do that systematically across the city. That's the story of New York. 
is it, do we always get it absolutely right or in the timely way or miss a particular book that a particular program needs? We, that happens and we're delighted to add whatever we can, but we all agree we need our collections to be reflective of the neighborhoods and meet the interests and demands of our neighborhoods. Right. Thank, thank you for that. I would, I would, I would look out for those, those languages that, that don't make up you know, the plurality, the, the, the top, I guess, tier languages, um, but really you know, are, are, would be very impactful to have those books um, in the libraries as, as, you know, as a matter of course, not as a matter of reaching out. Um, my second question, I was really pleased to hear both the Brooklyn and Queens testimony talk about uh, anti-racist, anti-bias anti training. I, I know across the country this was done in response to the, uh, to, to the George Floyd murder. Um, you know, we were speaking before the committee hearing, these are the lives of my students that are going to be positively impacted. Um, you know, you mentioned in the, uh, for the Queens Library, uh, welcoming the LGBTQ community, so important as we're seeing a, a rise in hate. Um, we are also, over the years, seeing a rise in hate against our Asian brothers and sisters. Uh, and of course, anyone who watches uh, the news or reads NYPD hate crime statistics uh, will know there's a significant increase in anti-Semitism uh, both in terms of reported hate crimes and in terms of what, uh, let's just call them celebrities, or former presidents inviting Holocaust deniers to wine and dine with him. So just to read in the third quarter, um, the uh, hate crimes incidents by bias motivation, there were 47 against Jewish New Yorkers, 21 against Asian New Yorkers, uh, 18 against what the NYPD identifies as anti-male homosexual, um, and in parentheses, gay, the second quarter, 64 against Jewish, uh, Asian, 20, anti-male, homosexual, 24 in the second quarter. I'm bringing all this up to ask the question is, how often do you go back and revisit your anti-bias, anti-hate trainings, and does it explicitly include things like anti-Semitism, which we are seeing a significant rise in both in physical, verbal assault, Holocaust denying, does it explicitly include anti-Asian hate, uh, anti-LGBTQ, and what other efforts are you making to ensure that all of our communities are welcome and educated uh, in coming together so we can uh, prevent these types of, this increase in hate that we are, that we are seeing and is deeply troubling uh, for, for all of us? So uh, one of the things that we learned in the aftermath of uh, the George Floyd killing um, was the importance of not only visiting these things episodically, but making sure that um, A, our own house was in order, um, that we were in fact um, not uh, even unconsciously um, somehow contributing to the problem but that we were um, consciously making sure that we were not engaging in any behavior that would be deemed anti-racist uh, racist or anti-Semitic, anti-Asian, um, certainly anti-LBGTQ. And also making sure that the way we operate on a daily basis incorporates that philosophy day in and day out. And so uh, it's a very, as I said, it's part of our strategic plan. It's part of what we've been um, very conscious of, certainly before George Floyd, but perhaps not with the same level of urgency um, as we've been addressing these topics over the past two, three years. So as I stated that we have started with EDI training even before the pandemic and before the increase of what you've identified and that we are looking at all of our internal policies as well. So we're not just looking at them for, um, for we're looking at them overall to make sure that they are in line with our staff and then how we project that out to our customers. Every Tuesday morning, we, um, most of our branches are closed on Tuesday morning. That is a time for us to identify trainings that all the staff need. So it's a great opportunity for all the staff to be able to participate. So we do um, trainings every week and we modify them accordingly. So we do, um, so we would do, let's, like I was saying, EDI training. We were doing anti-racist training. Our security staff actually goes out to all, uh, goes out to all of our branches to work with our, our staff so that when they identify someone coming in, and certainly we've had incidents where people come in and they are quite offensive. 
And how do we protect our staff? How do we protect our customers? And when is it time to call in the authorities to make sure that um, people like, you know, who are behaving like that leave the premises because there's no place for that. Um, we've also updated our policies so that um, staff feel that they have more, uh, they have more backup when it comes to reporting incidences against them. Quite honestly, whether they be from maybe other staff, but oftentimes from, um, from our uh, customers. And then we investigate that um, and to make sure that our staff, our, our number one priority is the safety of our staff, uh, mentally and physically, and the safety of everyone that's in the building. And we do that from, on an ongoing basis. Thank you, of course, I would, I would hope it, I mean the purpose of these trainings and the education, and of course uh, bringing, bringing the, the children in as part of your education that you so wonderfully do, is to prevent those things from ever happening in the first place. And that's, of course, I think the ultimate goal. I would ask that you treat the, 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 the rise in rhetoric uh, against, you know, again, the LGBTQ community and, and against the Jewish community, the rise in rhetoric and hate crimes with the sense of urgency that it deserves and it needs. Uh, and I hope that, that that becomes integral and part of your Tuesday morning meetings and more long-term solutions to these problems. And I would add a thing that I don't know one way or the other you do, but I would say this is a problem uh, when, when, when these trainings are done and that when decisions are made, that members of the specific community are included in the development of those trainings. It seems silly that I have to say that, but unfortunately, you know, we've come across a lot of trainings that teach, uh, you know, a lot of non-black people are, you know, creating these trainings about how to not be, you know, about what it's like to be black. And non-Asians are, uh, you know, part of creating these trainings about, uh, about the, the experiences of the Asian community. I can go on and on. Uh, but I would just encourage you and make sure that that very obvious thing is, which is not obvious to so many other uh, people and agencies, uh, is integral in your, in your planning. Uh, I, I, again, want to thank the chair for your flexibility and, and for this hearing. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. And I want to dive straight into uh, the meat of um, this hearing in, in terms of the pegs, which is something that uh, we've all acknowledged throughout this hearing already, all three of you through your testimonies, as well as mine and my opener. Um, and it's something that we truly believe is going to affect one of the only public spaces in New York City, which is our, our, our library. So I, I want to start by saying, and we'll start with you, President Johnson, how do you anticipate that the current PEG and additional cuts in the coming years will affect your programming related to equity and civic engagement? Yeah, um, obviously this is the topic that's front of mind for all of us as we've been trying to absorb the news and then plan for uh, the future. And I think um, that in the current fiscal year, um, we anticipated a cut. Um, it's been difficult to hire people so that while we are operating um, with a much reduced staff right now and not to good end, I mean, it's, it's challenging to maintain hours when you don't have enough staff, but we've been diligent about making that work. But there is just so long you can make that work. And so our hope was that we would get through uh, the current year and then, and, and I will add that it, as difficult as it, as it has been to hire, we've been making progress. So there was a time when we were losing people uh, at a faster clip than we were able to replace them. That has leveled out, but we're still down quite a number of uh, positions. The real problems uh, will come in uh, in the next fiscal year when our baseline budget will be cut. And um, the thing about the library business is that it is highly labor intensive. There are not a lot of places to go to save money, to cut the budget. Um, and basically it comes down to wages and salaries and that translates to the number of hours that we will be able to be opened. And then that of course affects the number of programs that you're able to offer. And so it has a cascading effect uh, and a bad one. And uh, you know, as I said in my remarks, and both my colleagues also um, reiterated that um, at a time when we should be open longer hours, when we should be doing more of the great work that we do and being creative about new and innovative ways to deliver service, we will in fact be forced to uh, operate 
uh, fewer hours. I'm not saying that any one branch would be closed altogether, but there will be a cutback, and therefore there will be a diminution in the amount of programming that we're able to do. And I'm understanding that that same sentiment is rings true for you, Mr. Buron, and, and you, President Marks, correct? Um, go ahead. When we think about this, I mean, the way to, sorry, the way to think about the way you think about this, I think about it, and it keeps me up nights uh, thinking about this, is given everything we have built to do and the even greater demand that we continue to struggle to keep up with, um, what, what happens when, you know, the, this year we can absorb an awful lot just because we've been good managers, stewards of our resources, um, but the coming pegs will simply put us in the question of saying what gives? Is it the basics, hours, branches, the stuff that New Yorkers think of as foundational and a right to know that their library will be open? Or is it the innovative education programs, opportunity programs that working with the mayor, with the city council, we've been building and targeting in exactly the needs because we are everywhere, we're trusted everywhere, and we have the capacity to innovate accordingly. The peg going forward, the next peg, will present us with the choice of which of those gives. Is it the basics of the furniture, the hours, the number of, you know, the whatever it is, the how many staff we can have and therefore what services we can offer? Or are we going to start having to backtrack on exactly the investments that we've said we need to be doing at this juncture for all the groups and individuals that we've been discussing? That is a horrible situation to be in. The, the mayor has made it clear that he has priorities. We understand those priorities. We understand there are hard choices to be made. We understand the importance of you know, the, 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 the crime issues that the mayor is addressing. We also notice that he has pulled out pedagogy as the exception. The investments the city needs to make are in making sure that the citizens are secure, and that they are have the opportunities to learn. That is the business we are in. We should not be in the, having to make choices of throwing things overboard that we've all built you know, as essential items over these last years. I would just add one thing, um, and that is I don't, I don't think that we'll actually be in a situation where we, it's an either or. I think we will be cutting both. That we will be, uh, if you talk, if you look at the numbers as they've been presented, and I know the dance has just begun, as we call it. Um, but if, if we end up where we are today, we will be cutting everywhere that we can. And so that's a, a, a terrible place to be. I would only add that our greatest resource is the staff that we have in our buildings who are serving the public. You heard today the incredible wide range of things that we are doing topics that we are doing, initiatives that we're doing, the amount that we're helping the city, the amount that we're working with the city, and clearly, if we receive less resources, we are clearly need to do our, we have no choice but to do less, and that would be a great shame for yeah. the city. And, and I, I want to ask, and this is all under the same umbrella of, of the PEGS topic, um, and it's okay if you don't have these numbers now, but we are talking about um, the potential that the library would have to cut back on hours and, and potentially days. Uh, have you all made those calculations in terms of what these numbers would look like? Um, we have not. We're just in the process of, right. of making those calculations um, and also at the same time ramping up um, an advocacy program to mm -hmm. see if we can't um, do better than, uh, than the news that was recently delivered. Mm -hmm. I would just say the same thing for us. And in fact, there will be multiple scenarios depending on how much really there is cut. And so there's a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. But right now, as Linda said, now is the time to explain to everyone the hard work that we're doing so that we don't get to that point. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of the, the ramping up of the advocacy campaign, uh, it would be helpful for you know myself as well as other council members that are supporters of uh, the libraries and do not want to see these pegs uh, come into fruition. It'd be helpful to have a, a picture or an idea of what these pegs would look like in terms of how much staff would be lost, how many, whose wages would be cut, uh, how many hours would be cut from each library branch, maybe potential closures of these specific branch, branches. Uh, you'll be tired of us. 
We protect those services as well as, you know, our essential staff, which are, you know, we've spent decades building this amazing mm-hmm. staff. We can't be, you know, we, we have to keep everybody on board. Um, no doubt everyone sitting at this table says the same thing, but mm-hmm. we all feel <laughs> and feel that we've demonstrated over time that we do, um, sorry, it sounds self-serving, but we do a really incredible job with the money that we um are granted that mm-hmm. we make the most of every dollar, that we deliver, uh, you know, far and away uh, more than what would normally be expected given the size of our budgets relative to the size of our respective institutions. Mm-hmm. Um, I hate to say, you know, get a lot for your buck with us, but but it's really it's really true. Um, we do good work. Mm-hmm. And I mean, just a piece of advice, even though you probably know this already, once you guys are ramping up again. Um, you know, DC 37 is just a great uh, ally to, to use as a support system uh, in providing some pressure on the administration um, to fight against those potential cuts. Um, something that I wanted to ask you, uh, because, you know, the city likes to plan hearings at the same time right now, and there's a very important hearing happening across the street at City Hall uh, where the Finance Committee is discussing the November plan uh, and the pegs that are b- impacting our various different systems. Um, what questions would you want council members or myself uh, to ask of the administration in terms of these pegs uh, when it pertains to the libraries? Uh, again, the administration, they, are, they have their challenges and they have been incredible partners and we will work through this together. I mean, I think, you know, that there is the sort of hope that we can just continue to sort of find ways to absorb cuts that don't reduce the staffing numbers or the services or the hours or the programs. The simple fact is we've, you know, we've been playing that game for years, getting more efficient, even though I have a hard time describing sort of the world of education in efficiency terms, but we have become more efficient. But at some point, you get to the bone. Um, and, you know, we keep getting closer and closer to that bone, and this may push us over the edge. And at that point, the question is, what is it you want us to stop doing exactly, mm. right? I mean, I, I, think, I think the question really is, you know, what you expect of your partners. Mm-hmm. And we've been, uh, and, and especially during the pandemic, worked really hard to figure out how to be the best partners to the city that we could be and to step up. Uh, you know, to the plate to help, whether it was with COVID testing or helping people find vaccines. When I, you know, it, it went on and on. It wasn't exactly uh, what we were accustomed to doing in the past, but I think that it's demonstrative of exactly the kind of work that we're willing to do and that uh, if you reduce our services, it's not clear where the slack is, is picked up. It's not clear what other uh, institutions or city agencies will step in and take care of the people that, you know, our patrons, the millions of people. I mean, we always love to quote this mm-hmm. number, you know, just how many people come to visit libraries in a given year. You know, we get over a million people just at our central mm-hmm. library, but the fact that more people visit the libraries in the city of New York than go to all sporting events, in, you know, in all teams combined. I mean, people really do trust us and come to us, and if we're not there, I don't, I don't really know where they go. So it's less of a question than you know, an advocate, an internal advocate for us. And it's important when the city does their budgets to determine what are the priorities for this city. And yet again, I think what you've heard here today is that we hit on education. We hit on you know, keeping communities safe. We hit on sustainability. We hit on equity. All the priorities that the city has said we actually do very well in coordination with the city and with our staff, and to cut us would be to cut those priorities. Did you all engage in dialogue with the administration prior to PEGS coming out? I mean, 
I would say we're always we're in always we in were always in conversation about the pegs about the the potential. But was that a topic of discussion with the administration? Um, so our finance team, and I'm sure the same is true of Queens and New York Public Library, are in constant touch with the Office of Management and Budget. It's a mm -hmm. it's a dialogue that never stops. <laughs> okay. Um, speaking of libraries taking the responsibility of multitude of different issues that our city seems to encounter, whether it's the census, whether it's, uh, you know, getting involved in, in civic, civic leadership, um, you know, vaccine drives. A topic of discussion in the city right now is obviously our, our asylum, asylum seekers and the, the migrant crisis that is increasing at a daily rate. And Mr. Buron, I, I know you acknowledged some of the services that the libraries have been providing uh, for the migrants and QPL, um, but I want to start with asking you, you know, and, and all three of you, that the, the three library systems provide a variety of civic engagement programming and services to support immigrants and BIPOC New Yorkers. Um, I want you to describe the outreach being done to promote these programs, uh, services and events to immigrants and BIPOC New Yorkers, um, and how do these PEGs impact the system's capacity to do thorough and comprehensive outreach? Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, I, first of all, you know, as I said, it'll be a, a situation where we have to cut everywhere. everywhere. Yeah, yeah, and the work that we're doing, um, especially with our newest Americans, the, the asylum seekers, um, it, you know, it, there are, uh, tr there's transitional housing near branches, and the local branches are bringing material to the housing. In our case, hotels, um, bringing backpacks filled with books. Um, making sure that um, our IDMYC offices are staffed and open because the lines there have uh, grown exponentially since uh, all this began. Um, so we're very sensitive to the situation and we're, you know, and we are, um, th these are our new patrons and we're doing our best to make sure that they have library cards, IDMYC cards, and everything that we can um, do to make their lives better. And just an overall yes or no question, have you seen um, migrants and asylum seekers coming into all of your spaces? We've seen a tremendous amount, yeah. mm -hmm. a tremendous amount. And there's a good example of this is on a Monday morning at, the, at our central library in Jamaica, we have a line that goes from our door around the block wow. because what we're seeing is one of the first steps that, that, the, uh, that these new arrivals, when they come off, they go to temporary housing where we have relationships with these temporary housing already so that we're able to do outreach to those temporary housing, and they need an IDNYC card. Mm -hmm. Now, it is not our program, um, per se, but, we, but the space that we give them means that they're coming to the library, to a trusted place. We take that very seriously, and the way we interact with people who are scared, have young children, um, they come for that ID, and like I said, you know, sometimes they're waiting hours in line. Mm -hmm. Um, to not be able to interact with someone in their own language is also very scary. So we make sure our staff at our central library is volunteering to mm -hmm. speak, you know, Spanish with them for those that speak Spanish. Our administrative staff who are in the, our central library building are volunteering mm -hmm. to do this too, to make sure that there's always someone who can communicate. It's the start of communication. It's working with them to get that ID so that they go into their kids' schools, which they cannot do. If you don't have some form of identification, it's helping them enroll their kids in school, enrolling in benefits, finding more than temporary sh um, housing. It's, it's overwhelming for the city to be sure, and we could not be a better partner for the city in these times of, uh, uh, of crisis and challenges. Uh, for us, the Bronx Library Center is probably ground zero for this, and obviously the IDNYC program is, is essential. Look, let me just state the, the obvious. This is a city, this is a country of immigrants, period. This is not a burden we should shirk or look to avoid. This is what has made New York the center of the world, the, that we are welcoming to the diversity of talent that makes us the center of the world. This is a difficult set of circumstances, all kinds of wacko politics uh, nationally going on uh, around this. I'll just say, this administration has been a great partner with us consistently. I mean, whether it goes back to the investment in the teen centers that we've talked about. But on this issue, we met just yesterday, I think it was, we met with the deputy mayor, Maria Torres Springer, and her staff. We're meeting with them regularly. I don't think that ever happened in previous administrations. There is a level of 
serious engagement and back and forth. Yesterday, the topic of asylum seekers came up, and we were all right on. Do we have the right mappings of where the, where the populations are, where our branches are? Let's do, go to the next level of coordinating, going from the branch to where those folks are, making sure that they, you know, people come from countries where they didn't have public libraries. They didn't understand what it's free, and you, you, know, you won't ask for my papers, you won't turn me in. I mean, these are all essential items and again, I think that the administration really recognizes us as, as a partner in this and in so much more and have really stepped up in a seriousness mm -hmm. of conversation that I, I just, with all the issues they face, the budget choices, I want to give a, a shout out to, on that side as well. And are you collecting data in terms of these folks that are coming in on because of this migrant crisis? I think that's so important for you know everyone to know that. Yes and no. Mm -hmm. Yes and no. So of course we want to, you know, we want to show how busy we are. That's mm -hmm. how we show how important we are, is, you know, with the services that we're providing. But one of the reasons that People we come, are so known yeah. to the immigrant community, who otherwise, as Tony just said, mm -hmm. who might not trust civic institutions mm -hmm. wh where they're from, is that we don't ask for this information when they mm -hmm. come in. We say welcome. We say we're glad that you're here. How and can we? And yeah, in multiple languages. Do you know how folks find out? Like how, how they find out know? from their neighbors and their friends, mm -hmm. and they find out, and certainly the city as well, who says go here for NYC for IDNYC. Mm -hmm. But really, it's at this point we have such a reputation within communities and even internationally that people know when you come to New York, you want free libraries, to, uh, free service, mm -hmm. and free English classes, and helpful people to help you, and trusted individuals to help you who will not ask you all these questions to mm -hmm. scare you away, you go to the public library. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, as someone that obviously works for the city and has felt that pressure across our five boroughs of this migrant crisis, we haven't been given many resources from the federal and state government in terms of how to handle it. You know, it could obviously be handled better, but it is a little bit of a mess. But to hear that your three systems are uh, really at the forefront of supporting this crisis in the ways that you are is is fantastic. Which you know, I'll segue into a question which I already know the answer of. But but how will these pegs impact the staffing of, of those of staffers that you know speak these languages and are able uh, to to provide support? Um, for these migrants that are, are coming to, to these, these, these libraries? Well, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, if you cut hours, um, you reduce the number of hours a day that we would be there to give, get you signed up for an IDNYC card, to get you, you know, the information you need about schools and uh, housing and everything else. So um, in addition to sort of the content of what you're um, offering to these families, you're actually cutting the, the number of, uh, the, right, the contact, the, pro, the number of people you're able to process in mm -hmm. any given day. It's really devastating. It's less outreach. Mm -hmm. It's less English language classes. It's less support. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. And less means less people are served, and those are real people. Yeah. So this isn't just numbers for us. You know, we see that we know that every one of these numbers is a person walking in that door that has a need. It is an incredible thing when someone comes in. We take it very seriously. People come into our library all the time and they say to us, I need help. Mm -hmm. Can you help me? And our answer is yes. And the admin knows this. You sure. Um, speaking about our, our children and our migrant children, has, uh, have the three systems been collaborating with the Department of Education? Um, in terms of uh, supporting new students that are going into these systems? We, we, the three systems met with the chancellor and all the deputy chancellors most recently, I think it was two weeks ago, last week? Two weeks ago. The, um, and we are reviewing every practice and looking for every opportunity to collaborate. Uh, I think we all understand that we have to do we all have to lend a shoulder to whatever improvements we can have and to supporting the amazing teachers in New York and the students in New York. And the libraries are the key partner. The My Libraries NYC was established now more than a decade ago so that we could provide circulating library collections into schools. Now we're talking to the schools about their civics, 
uh, a la the topic of today, uh, their civics curriculum and how we can provide documents and, and help to make that work. I mean, we are, we are eager and grateful to work with the chancellor and his colleagues in every way we can, and some of us even come back from those backgrounds. I want to turn to Councilmember Joseph for some questions. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for the work that you do. As the Ed Chair and prior to getting into the Council, I was still teaching. And I have to say this on the record, and how you came and you were a lifeline to our communities, especially our students facing digital divide. You came in and you plugged in those holes when our students did not have broadband to get on Google, Google Classroom. I thank you on behalf of New York City educators and also myself as an educator, for, forever educator, 22 years in, I thank you. We cannot, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, we cannot afford to cut a dime from New York City Public Libraries because you are the lifeline to so many. You go into so many areas, whether it's our teens, our seniors, um, and all of those aspects, job, ESL programming, and even at one point you were doing food distribution. The libraries were not built for that, but you pivoted in the one we needed it the most. So I thank you for that. I just wanted to find out, during the pandemic, you came, you served New York City public students with even laptops and even broadband. Most people probably didn't know that. Has the relationship after the pandemic maintained with the public schools and the DOE to continue to serve students that may still face um, the lack of digital tablets, devices, or broadband? The short answer is yes. Um, and um, the more nuanced um, response is that everything that we're doing on the digital front with respect to digital literacy is designed, uh, obviously, with students in mind, um, but frankly, with, with everyone in mind. And some, uh, one of the things we've been working on is figuring out how the programs for students also can help our older adults um, who, who need to be connected. Um, and a lot of the work that we did during the pandemic um, could be looked at as band-aids, as ways to solve problems for individuals. Um, but those individuals, those kids were only in the third grade one time and, and they needed that. And, and at the same time now that we've emerged, um, we're trying to uh, you know, shine a light on these issues to make sure that, um, that we address the issue of connectivity um, in a way that's lasting, that's not, you know, sort of the one at a time, the extending the signal out from every building. It's not, it's not the library's job to do that, but it was the library's ability to do that that made life so much better for the students of the city of New York. You know, one of the things that we dedicated ourselves at the library during the pandemic was to come out stronger and to be able to continue things that we learned that worked well and some things that we tried that didn't work well. Um, and making sure that we had a supply of hotspots available so that people could get connected. That to make sure that we get more online resources, such as more homework help resources um, for longer extended hours so that young people who are in school who might be having trouble are able to, you know, are able to access you know, a, a knowledgeable person to help them with their homework. We would like to have more homework help assistance after school. That's, that's an ask, that's a priority of ours, and that's something that we would like as well to be able to do more of. And so that works well. Uh, we know that young people really like that in-person assistance, and so we wanna make sure that we are there after school every day um, to provide that help. Thank you. Is digital literacy going to be one of the things that you, the library provides in terms of our seniors? Not only did we see our young people struggle with digital divides, so did our seniors. When it came down to registering for vaccination, when centers closed, these are the things that I was seeing on the ground. So the answer is, the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think though, um, in an emergency, because we are in every neighborhood, because we're trusted, because our amazing staff were there, right, physically there, we could offer the Band-Aids and the emergency solutions. You know, the mayor came to describe us as a Swiss army knife um, of, of a certain type, you know, everything that you need. And I think that's important. 
But I also I'd want to reiterate, let's not pat ourselves, let's not think Band-Aids are solutions. They are Band-Aids. We need systemic solutions. The idea that there are millions of New Yorkers, New Yorkers outside the digital, you know, without broadband at home, like is like mind boggling. It's beyond mind boggling. It's outrageous. And we can do hotspots and we're all trying various things. We're, we're investing again in citizens band radio to see if that can be part of a literally a sort of public utility notion of, of how to provide broadband at a basic level. We're working with, through our Center for Educators and Schools, how do we get stuff systemically into the curriculum, uh, primary documents, the after schools or systemic approaches. We need to invest in those system approaches because otherwise we'll, we'll just keep doing Band-Aids. And the Band-Aids are expensive and don't work in the end. They don't solve the problem. Um. So in case no one knows this, you know, we are the largest providers of free Wi-Fi in the city. And so And skills training yeah, as well. But but the point yeah, but but the point is that this is a problem that we've witnessed for a long time. Um, you know, pre pandemic, if I were to say to somebody that thirty percent of the households in Brooklyn didn't have Wi Fi, they would they would be like, What? And, and it didn't stay with them because uh, people in our worlds are on and offline all day long. Um, I think the pandemic actually uh, did serve to shine a light on this issue. People now understood uh, more deeply what it was like if you were on the wrong side of the digital divide, if you couldn't educate your children, if you couldn't apply for benefits of one sort or another. So there's now an understanding or, or at least a, a, a better awareness of the issues. And so now really is the time that we need to fix these problems in a more comprehensive way. And to the extent that the library can be part of that and part of the um, and part of this awareness campaign, we're here ready, and we have standing actually to make the case. You know, what's interesting is that our older adults and our homebound were some of the best users of our virtual, uh, virtual programs and virtual classes that we had during the pandemic. And so coming out of that, we can't abandon that new priority. And that's the thing is, you know, I personally have been with the library for 29 years. We're doing more than we've ever done before. Yeah I, yeah, I know it's, <laughs> but I've never seen the library do more in so many various areas, and it just, the priorities just keep mounting, and we are here to accept that. We're not here to say, take, take these priorities away from us and give it to somebody else. We want this, but we absolutely need the resources to make this happen. So, um, not to beat a dead horse, but <laughs> um, we came out of, um, of the, or as we're coming out of the um, pandemic, uh, having built a much, much more robust digital enterprise and realizing, you know, unquestionably that we need to continue that work, that it is our future and that it's a vital part of what we're doing, but at the same time that we can't abandon the traditional library services. And so we're trying, all of us, to figure out how to continue to maintain both uh, the digital and the traditional services that we offer at the same time hearing from the city that actually we're not going to have as much money to do it. And that's, I think, uh, all the other stuff is interesting and right, but that's really at the core of what's going on here. Thank you, Chair. Of course. Uh, so moving on to more civic engagement questions, you know, we just went through another long election cycle. Uh, what efforts by the libraries uh, supported voting in, in this last voting election or voting season, this last month's election? Um, I'll start everybody. everybody can chime in. We all, um, we all do quite a lot. In Brooklyn, 18 of our libraries become um, polling sites. That's the most uh, you know, tangible thing. Uh, but all we're registering people to vote. We're, um, we have a whole civic... Uh, civics Commons, uh, which is designed to um, make sure that our citizenry is well educated about elections, about their role and responsibilities as people who live in a democracy. Um, it is uh, we, civic literacy, the, one of the most important things that we do, um, and we do it all year long, and, uh, but never more than uh, during an election season. And we also encourage elected officials um, to come and use library branches 
uh, as a way to, as a place to engage with citizens, as a place to make them aware of uh, what the issues are and how particular elected officials and candidates uh, are looking at the issues and, and trying to solve them. You'll find uh, our numbers again in the testimony. Uh, I mean, amongst them, uh, over 4,000 participants in uh, 335 civic focused programs. We held 25 voter registration events at 22 branches and 35 voter education events at 21 branches, again, highlighting the neighborhoods with the least resources and often the least uh, civic engagement or voter turnout. We're, we, there are a set of programs that we do uh, as tri -li. We work with the League of Women's Voters as well as we have a particular focus in Staten Island at this point. I mean, but again, I'll just back up and say everything we do is about empowering and informing the citizenry across the board. And no one else is focused on doing that in the pockets of the population that are the least resourced and are participating the least and getting the least as a result. And those, we are in those neighborhoods and helping those folks, there is more that we can do. Again, we, we'd love to be having more training than we are, as more voter uh, programs. We'd like to help neighborhoods figure out how they can mobilize themselves around local problems and get the kinds of responses that the city council and the administration want to be able to give an interlocutor with their neighbors, with our communities. There is, because democracy is strained, if not under threat at this point, nationally, globally, New York can, can and must demonstrate the alternative that we can make and do make democracy work here in this city. That's not a small task, but we're, we're sort of front and center for it. You know, the numbers, as Tony said, the numbers are in the testimony about you know, how many libraries were used for early voting, for voting sites. Again, more than ever before. So more than ever before, people are coming to the libraries to vote in New York City at their local library. And again, it's an opportunity for people who otherwise might not come to the library to be able to see what's offered. But I just wanted to, you know, as you, you heard from Tony and Linda about the importance, I'm just going to take a step back and say our help with the census that we did increased the voter rolls because we were able to count more people. You know, the library was very instrumental in working with the city and working with the government to, to make sure everyone was counted because unless you are initially counted, then you cannot be represented adequately. And so yet again, this is just part of a continuum of what we are doing to make sure that everyone counts. And you all shared how your uh, branches have hosted multiple um, civic engagement events. At those events, um, do you teach things like ranked choice voting um, or ballot proposals? Yeah. Awesome. Um, <laughs> that's it? That's great. Um, <laughs> uh, how have libraries helped to increase voter engagement amongst communities where turnout can be tricky? Uh, with BIPOC voters, NYCHA residents, uh, young voters, Gen Z voters, immigrant voters, uh, or new citizen? I think, look, again, the realities we are all painfully aware, or should be painfully aware, are that it is in the least resource neighborhoods that uh, folks are not you know, finding the educational opportunities that they need, uh, that they are not finding the progress uh, in terms of their, you know, the economic opportunities they want as well as learning opportunities. The, those neighborhoods tend to use digital less, partly because of the broadband problem, which is a structural problem. Uh, not they are no fault here that they just they don't have those tools that, and so we have to actually sort of double down in our outreach in those neighborhoods in all these fronts and including voter and in a sense because we're the only ones in those neighborhoods doubling down on all the skills all the all the seminars all the discussions all the educational programs those are all designed to energize and give agency to those citizens who either don't feel it 
or don't see it or don't think that they have the wherewithal or the right to it. And we're the ones who are there to, to argue against and give them the resources. And that's part of what democracy needs at this point, and we're essential for it. And you said yourself, Chair, that, you know, we are in over 200 neighborhoods. So we are the central location in every neighborhood. We are the center of community in every neighborhood. So when I was talking about our trainings, for example, that we do on Tuesdays, uh, during election time, our training is how do we train our staff you know, on the front lines to be able to engage with our customers who come in, but also who do not come in to do the outreach to get them, to get the information to them as well. And that's part of our mission as well. We're actually targeting neighborhoods that have um, historically been low turnout, um, in particular Bushwick, Coney Island, Brownsville, Bed-Stuy. Um, and we're working with community-based organizations to um, provide workshops uh, in languages other than English to make sure that people um, can understand uh, how to do it and the importance of being engaged. I, I also do want to shout you guys out for you know, I tend to all of our community board general meetings, and Nicole Bryant from, you know, our, our Macomb Public Library yes. branches at every single community board meeting with a presentation of what the, the library is doing for the month. Yeah. So it's just really amazing to see how engaged um, our libraries are in well, the community. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, in fact, Macomb, as you know, is a polling site. Mm -hmm. um, I have one more question because you all have been extremely efficient in your, your testimonies as well as, you know, throughout the questioning, as you always are. Um, but do you receive support or coordinate with any other city agencies um, in, in doing the outreach um, in regards to your, your civic program? Yeah. Uh, I don't have a list right in front of me, Mr. Chair. We're happy to get it to you. But we, we find allies and support across the board. I mean, I think we all, let's be, let's be clear. We, I think there is so much consensus in this city, in the administration, in the city council about what needs to be done and where we need to invest it. Yes, we face particular economic uncertainties. The administration is trying to adjust to those. But I would say, actually, you know, it's astonishing the partnerships that, that we have with nonprofits, with the city council, with the administration, uh, with the OMB that are right on top of it all the time. Yes, we all have challenges and we all have hard decisions to make, which is why democracy to air those and discuss them is so important and why we welcome this opportunity because we know if people understand better, if people recognize, pay attention to what sort of is taken for granted coming from libraries, then everyone will understand why that needs to not just be protected, but built upon in terms of the bang for the buck, to use Linda's uh, phrase. Elegant. Huh? Elegant, yeah. The, um, you know, I, and I think the, part, the, the sense of understanding and appreciation and, and mutual support of that with the council, with the administration, with OMB, with all of our you know, neighborhood partners is palpable. We just need to continue to make it real. I'm sitting here thinking about all the agencies that we partner with, you know, whether it's the you know, Board of Elections or the Department of Health during the pandemic. I can't think of a time, it's been 29 years, but it's been a long time. I can't think of a time when we ever said to the city administration or to a particular um, agency, uh, no, I'm sorry, we can't do that with you. Um. And without further ado, I thank you all for, for testifying today and uh, for providing great responses to the questions that we had for you. Um, we'll turn it over to public testimony, correct? Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Hello? Hi, thank you, Ms. Sexton. We'll just wait one moment. We'll be switching to public testimony in one moment. And our next panel of public testimony will be a Zoom panel. The witness is Lucy Sexton. 
Before we close the hearing after our first public panel, we will check for anyone we inadvertently missed for the record. We're just transitioning. It will be one moment. We'll, we'll be moving to public testimony and our witness Lucy Sexton in several, in just one minute. And Ms. Sexton, are you ready to testify as well? Sure. Can you hear me? Um, we can. So at this point, we will move to public testimony. As a reminder, there's a two minute clock. Um, you may begin your testimony when ready. Hi, everybody, coming to you from the uh, Long Island Expressway, heading out to Flushing Town Hall. Um, my name is Lucy Sexton. Uh, I, I am with New Yorkers for Culture and Arts, which is a coalition of more than 300 uh, cultural organizations and cultural workers uh, from across the five boroughs. And I'm here, um, I'm speaking off my remarks, but I did email the remarks to everyone. Um, I'm here in support of the uh, two intros, one calling for an end to the Jones Act and the other calling for an end to the contract with Luma in Puerto Rico. Uh, I was really, really honored to go to San Juan last month and to produce an event with uh, the Caribbean Cultural Center Africa Diaspora Institute and uh, the San Juan uh, organization, Tayer Comunidad uh, La Goico. And uh, we held an event where we brought together local San Juan cultural centers and cultural leaders to discuss what had been happening since Hurricane Fiona, to talk about the services that they were providing to their community, including, speaking of Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi and power uh, and food, and in some cases, shelter. Um, and it was the, the, the topic of the discussion that we put together was called The Role of the Artist is to Make Revolution Irresistible. Um, and it was about the fact that you cannot continue to serve your culture, serve your community um, without addressing the things that are uh, oppressing uh, that are uh, oppressing your community um, and the need to to engage a political, on a political level. And I really salute uh, the council those intros to, uh, to speak out about in support of Puerto Rico. Um, the, I was very happy that the commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs, Lori Cumbo, came to the event. She engaged with local leaders and with uh, New York City uh, leaders who were there. I'm really, really proud of our New York cultural community in that we were able in two weeks to raise $20,000 
from artists, from small cultural groups, from the CIG, a lot of members of the cultural institutions group, as well as from the uh, lobbying firms that work for culture uh, in New York, the Wright Group, uh, Cozen O'Connor, Park and Kay. And we used it to put on the event, a small amount of it to put on the event, and then we donated most of it to the four cultural organizations that were part of the event in San Juan. So it is, it is, it is part and parcel of creating connection between New York and Puerto Rico. Uh, it has been a long connection uh, with artists and families and workers moving back and forth, certainly my entire life, between uh, New York and Puerto Rico. You know, New York culture is Puerto Rican culture. Um, and culture is community, is politics. So I really encourage the city council to support these intros, to send a message to our federal government that it is time to stop extracting uh, wealth and oppressing Puerto Rico and let Puerto Rico continue to thrive as an economy, as a community, as a culture. Thank you for letting me testify. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Sexton. Um, with that, that concludes this panel and the public testimony portion. If there is anyone that we inadvertently missed, um, please let us know using the raise hand function in Zoom. Or if there's anyone in the room, please let us know. I'm also going to read the names of witnesses that were registered for the record in case they're here. Priscilla Grimm and Christian Maldondo. We do not see any hands or anyone in the room. We do not see anyone on Zoom raising a hand. Okay, and that concludes the public testimony. Just one moment, we're just checking. That concludes the public testimony portion of this hearing. Chair Osei. Thank you so much, Brenda. And without further ado, I will adjourn today's hearing.